Sonic Speaks. Worked on several soundtracks for audio dramas and indie movies, such as Thorn in Paradise, Disillusion, Deceitful, and ten more, including acting as a producer on Game Camera. And most recently, the audio adaptation of Hounds of Heaven, based on the novel by Cole Drews and adapted by John Ward. He's the author of a ton of books, including V&A Shipping Books 1 and 2, Golden West Season 1 and 2, Murdunkian Tales, Paradise Palms, the My Teacher Is series of books, and so many more that I wouldn't have enough time to complete this interview if I spoke of all of them. And speaking of such, he's a voice actor with so many tons of different projects that, again, I wouldn't have enough time for the interview. Not, But not least of all, the most recent Electric Vicuna show called Black Knight. Together, they are John Carl Toth. J.R. Murdoch and Russell Gold. Good evening, gentlemen. How are you tonight? Doing great. Fantastic. Filled with awesome. I can take a deep breath. <laughs> Usually my interview, my, my introductions aren't as long-winded, but you guys have quite the pedigree. How did you get together in the first place? Blind random hmm. luck. Pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. I, I've worked with Russell. This is John. I've, I've worked with Russell for... I don't know, Russell. How many things have we worked on, at least? Going, well... I, Four, I've five, lost six, it's just, you seven. You just seem to show up as <laughs> other projects. Um, I I started off. I mean, I'm a I'm a composer. That's that's my big hobby. Is is more than anything else. It's a composer. And when I was starting off a couple years back, uh, maybe four years back now, I was in addition to doing movies and TV shows, things like that. I wanted to get more out there. I wanted to get more work out there. So I started thinking, huh. Oh, I like uh, audio dramas, so why not volunteer my efforts for that? And that's how Russell and I kind of started working together. But it was always like he knew me, I knew him. We didn't really meet a lot until, um, was it about two years ago, uh, I was on a panel doing interviews like this. And it was a show called Voice Fiction with Misfits Audio, which Russell works a lot with. And uh, Russell was one of the, uh, the guests on the, the show. And then from there, it just kind of friendship just came. So, John, I just before, and I, I'll ask the same question of everybody, so if you can go in turn, and John and Russell and JR, how did you guys, like you said, you liked radio drama. Where did you first sort of get the experience of radio drama? Because it's not very popular or hasn't been as popular until most recently. Well, um, okay. I guess the, the, the first experience you, you get really is as a – not so much as a participant, but it's just as a listener. I've always liked audio books. And then when I graduated to listening to audio dramas, when I realized that that was such a thing, it, it kind of blew my mind. So um, I, I was kind of always on the fringe doing music form and whatnot. And little by little, I was able to leverage the fact that I was doing music to, hey, put me in a part here and there. And I've done various things that way. So that's pretty much how I got in using my music as like a opening door. Right. And you, and you, Russell, I actually came in via web comics, web comics, web comics, which, which ones uh, got you most interested in, in the web? Cause there's a ton of web comics out there. There are, I started out on Usenet reading the uh, science fiction news group, which referenced an interesting panel in, uh, El Gunishayv went over to the, uh, forum and they talked about a whole bunch of others and then I was hooked. Right. And at some point I started really following the webcomic Misfile. Uh started writing my first fiction as fan fiction for Misfile and then said and one of the other ones that I was seeing then was something called Red String. And interestingly enough, Red String announced that they were gonna hold auditions for a radio play version of the story. Hmm. And I said, that sounds really cool. So I went and auditioned for that, and then I found there was this entire world of people doing audio dramas. That's awesome. And, and what about... And, sorry, go, go ahead. 
And I, I went, eventually I wound up doing my own adaptation of Misfile as an audio drama. That was my first time as a producer. Oh. Uh, and uh, I've done it from time to time. I've done uh, short, short uh, audio dramas. So you've not you, much. You've done some writing then as well. Yes. Well, I'm, we'll talk about that too because I'll be interested in, in what you've done on the writing side because I'm familiar with your with your acting, but not so much with the production and and, and writing too. So Jr., what about you? Uh, me, I've always been fascinated with audio ever since being a youngster, listening to those little records you rip out of old comics and actually play the rec <laughs> the audio that goes along with the comic. That's how I got right. introduced to audio originally. And I've always been fascinated with audio books, audio dramas. So 2004, 2005, when podcasting really started to come around, uh, I started doing a lot of uh, promos for different podcasts. Uh, slice of Sci-Fi, The Dragon Page. Um, I did a couple for Scott Sigler's audiobooks that he, they didn't get played. I don't know if they got lost in the ether or what happened, but mm -hmm. I just started recording some fun stuff. Uh, Jack Mangan's Deadpan podcast when he was out there. I did a lot of promos for him. And I had so much fun doing those promos, and I'm like, you know what? Patio Books just came on the scene. Let me drop in V&A shipping and see what happens. And it had thousands of listens on Patio Books. And then I did Billy Barbarian next. Again, thousands of listening listens. I recorded some of my short stories, which, as you said, is Murdochian Tales. A again, hundreds of downloads. And I thought, hey, with all these downloads, let's see what happens if these actually turn into sales. And that immediately went flat and nothing happened. And I, I decided, well, I'm just going to go ahead and keep on with my writing and see if I can contribute to other podcasts and to other audio dramas. So whenever I see somebody posting something out there, I'll throw my name out there going, hey, you need a, you need any help with that? You need a voice here or there? And I've done, I usually do bit parts because it's difficult to commit to an entire major role. So I'll say, hey, throw me any bit parts you got. I can do accents, I can do uh, fun voices, I can do crazy voices, I can be completely psychotic if you want me to be. <laughs> and as, as John will attest to, I've done some pretty fun voices so far for uh, Hounds of oh, Heaven. Yes. You you had a number of uh, offerings, uh, writings already to just sort of jump right into patio books? I did. At the time patio books got started, I had six books written. I'm currently up to 17 written, and I'm working on five others that I'm trying to complete, and I'm hoping to get many more completed this year. Um, Incredible. I'm, I'm rather prolific when it comes to writing. I just, if it's not reading, I'm writing. If I'm not reading and writing, I'm trying to listen to audio. And I'm just trying to immerse myself in what I would love to do as a career eventually. If it never happens, you know what? I'm having a great time trying. Well, great. I, I, I'm going to call this episode Sonic Workshop because that's something I've wanted to do is sit down with a whole bunch of people and talk about sort of getting under the hood with these kinds of things. So let's let's start with the writing since um, – Many people are involved in writing. Have you done some of the writing with Hound of Heaven too, John? Myself, no. Um, the, the difficulty that we have, well, let, let me give you let me back up a little bit. Uh, the, the author's name is Cole Drews. He's uh, a friend of mine that I've known for a while. He's, and he wrote the original novel. Yes, he did. Yes. And I knew him from some other stories that he wrote. We became Facebook friends. And then uh, Hounds of Heaven came out and I read it. I probably devoured it maybe in a week or maybe a little less than that. So it's a pretty big book. So anyways, I was talking to him one day and um, we're, how we got the subject but it was about doing like an audio book. And then I was like, well, yeah, but that's still going to take a long time. That's about, I don't know, probably eight hours of, of reading. And I'm kind of biased against audiobooks, to be honest. To, to me, audiobooks are nice if you're driving down the road and you want to listen to something. But it, the excitement level, depending on the content, it, it's kind of flat for me. I, and I guess I just like audio dramas more, the sound effects, everything else. So I said, well, what about doing as an audio drama? And I and he's like, well, okay, I have, I have a lot of people in my fan base that, that have been asking me to do that. Uh, can you do it? I'm like, sure, sure, sure. I know a lot of people. Ha, ha, ha. Little did I know. <laughs> One of the things I, I thought was interesting is when I looked at in the audio community, there's not a lot of people that are adapting books to the audio drama format. And I was thinking, okay, yes, we can get a lock on this. No one else is doing it. Well, I kind of found out why. Uh, it's ex it's a lot of work. Extremely <laughs> hard. The the bottleneck of the writing is is insane, and then of course the mixing is is pretty intensive too. I worked with the writers. 
I, I'm actually doing in, one right insane. now as we speak. Uh, for Colonial Radio Theater, I'm doing Agent 13. So, yeah, I, I hear you. It's, it's, it's an insane process. It really is. Agent 13? <laughs> yeah, Agent 13. Wait a minute. Um, hmm, I don't think I heard of that. I'm trying to think. It, it's very familiar. Yeah, Agent 13 is a trilogy. Well, it's, it's been released as a trilogy. The Invisible Air Empire uh, is the first one that Colonial Radio Theater has released. The second one is the one I'm writing right now is The Serpentine Assassin. And then there's Acolytes of Darkness. It's by Flint Dill and David wow. Marconi. Very exciting sort of World War II, James Bondish kind of uh, uh, sort of Doc Savage, Doc Savage. kind of feel wow. to it. Very, Very pulpy, cool. lots of fun. So, yeah, yeah. But it's, again, lots of work. As you can tell, uh, it's it's a huge project to, to try to go through chapter by chapter and it's easier with something that's pulpy because you know it's just you know action 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 but it, it's there's just a lot to do and from the sounds of hounds of heaven there's a there's a deep mythology there yes. with with uh, uh werewolves and vampires and so you got the first episode out right we, we got the first episode out and i think we we're a little too ambitious when we were first in the planning stages of this i mean initially believe it or not we were looking at uh, doing two a month. I don't know what we were drinking or whatever. Psychotic. But yeah, that's that's insane. That's insane. So it, we went through two writers, in fact, to try to. And mm -hmm. I, I mean writers. I mean adapters. Pe people that have either uh, have done teleplays or have done audio dramas, and the basic consensus is. This is not a good format. You know, this material is mm -hmm. not good. The story's fantastic. However, it's just, it's, without rewriting the book, it's just not very conducive to an audio drama. So we kind of put that on hold. And mm -hmm. we have a few other things that are smaller, for one thing. You know, Hounds of Heaven would probably have taken 16 half-hour episodes. And that's a big commitment, because what if one of the characters, actors, decides... They, they can't do it any longer for one reason or another. Right. That can happen. So we didn't want to go three or four episodes in and then have it fall you mm -hmm. know, or fail. So we decided what we're going to do is we're going to keep the same group and we're going to start adapting other things that are smaller, maybe, you know, 10,000 words, something like that. Now, these are these other things by Cold Drews or is just other works that could fit in uh, well, the Hounds of Heaven style universe or... What have you been thinking? Well, one of the things that we're going to do is there is a smaller story that Cole wrote called Family Man. It's um, kind of a, a it's, it's a zombie flick, but it's or a mm -hmm. zombie story, but it's it's a li neat little take of take off on that. It's not your typical thing where you're listening to all the zombies attack. It's not that. It's it's a neat little twist on it. It's a tightly focused story about. I think there's maybe five characters in it, and I don't want to give it away, but it's it's very very interesting what happens. But that's I think the I think we can do that in three episodes easily get it done an hour and a half. Mm. That's one thing we're doing, and Russell is looking at that currently about re, about adapting that. Now for for Jr. We are looking at taking his VNA shipping. And putting that in a long, continuous series. That would be great. Uh, yes. I mean, I, I like it. I mean, I, I read the book. Oh, and by the way, JR, I'm, I'm currently reading that one, the, um, the, the, the Trailer Park Murder Mystery. Yes. Fantastic. Par Paradise Palms. Yes, Paradise Palms. Fan fantastic. A murder mystery in a time-traveling trailer park. <laughs> Sounds great. So let's. So Russell, have you looked at this short story that, and you think that you can do this in – like an hour and a half and three installments then? I think it's going to be a lot shorter than that. Okay. There is there is a really splendid, horrific story in, the, in this. And there's a little bit of trimming down I do because the medium is very different. Right. But the, the, the core of the story is, is really, really cool. Okay. Now, this is another issue, like oftentimes when you have novels, you can have almost cast of thousands. So trying to trim it down into an audio drama to keep the cast manageable so you don't confuse the audience is a huge yes. issue. Is that what you're looking at as well? That's part of it. Some of it, I'm actually 
well, I don't want to go do too much details, but right now the way I'm thinking, I'm, I'm probably going to focus in a little bit more on the core of the story, and some of it will be sort of background. Okay. And right. you've done uh, adaptations before, as you mentioned. So how do you find the process for yourself? Do you, do you find that you, you need to read the, it over and over again to absorb it, or do you, you know, it read? It depends. It really depends. Okay. Yeah, it depends. I mean, when I, my, my first attempt was, web, uh, was a webcomic, mm -hmm. and I said, oh, this is going to be simple, because in each frame they're, they're talking. And then I realized, wait a minute, um, without the visuals, there's a lot of context lost. Mm -hmm. I have to make sure, not only do I have to make sure that the cast list stays small, because as you say, too many voices can confuse the audience. Mm -hmm. I also have to make sure not to do too many sudden scene changes. Because every time you do a scene change, it takes a little bit of time for the audience to figure out what you've done. Exactly, yeah. In a, in a webcomic, you can go one panel, one scene, next panel, a completely different scene. <laughs> you can just parallel them back and forth with two different right. stories seen by... You're right, yeah. So I, started, I found I had to start doing things a little bit out of order. Uh, sometimes I had to make up entirely new scenes, mm -hmm. and sometimes I had to cut scenes out. Yeah, I mean, in, in web comics and in novels and in movies, you can always have sort of a plot A, a plot B, a plot C, but you it's it's right. a lot more difficult running those kinds of things. It's not impossible, but it's a lot more difficult to do those with audio drama, isn't it? Yes. So it's just a question. That's why I said you have to focus more because the audience does not have all those cues as to what's going on if you don't. Okay. Now, now JR, what's it been like for you to make the, the jump? I love John's uh, phrase, and I don't know if he meant it on purpose, but graduating to radio drama I, from audiobook. <laughs> I thought I love that little term. I'm going to use that from now on. <laughs> just I, I, there is a, a sensation, at least from John's perspective, that it's it is a more difficult medium. Do you find that's the case as well for you taking your books and, and considering to do it in radio drama? Is it tricky for you? Well, if you have listened to VNA Shipping and Billy Barbarian, I do voices for all of them, so it's. It's not quite an audio drama because there's no music, there's no sound effects, but I am doing the voices for the characters so you know who's talking when. Mm -hmm. So I have worked that in. It's, I have done straight reads before. I just recently did a straight read for someone, and it, it came out really well because it was just a straight read. Mm -hmm. But for my, my own stuff, as I'm writing, I feel like I'm watching a movie, so I've got the voices in my head. So when I was converting my own to an audio audiobook production for patio books it just came naturally doing all the voices and i had an absolute blast doing some of the voices so it's it's going to be a lot of fun to see the different interpretations that people have when they do the voices um for those that haven't actually listened to vna shipping but are just reading the script and going along and it'll be entertaining for me to to see how the people translate that so are you are you planning to translate vna shipping then into straight radio drama that's, that's the plan, plan. That's the, because that's there's the a plan. lot of discussion about like the use of sound effects in audiobook jr and i'm i'd like your i'd like everybody's thought on this but if we can start with jr um and and you know the the problem is of course that at least as i see it and i have my own ideas but when you have sound effects in the audiobooks you almost need to clip out the description of, like, instead of saying, you know, a hammer sounded, and then having the sound of a hammer, <laughs> it starts becoming redundant for those kinds of things. Do you have particular uh, feelings about the use of sound effects and how much of an audio drama you want to put into an audio book itself, JR? For me, it depends on, on where John wants to take it. How, how much of an audio drama do we want to go for? And I'm open to, to anything. I really am. I know that my books, some of the complaints I've had with some of my books is I have a lot of dialogue. Hey, that, that works perfect. It'll be easier to convert to an audio drama. My people talk a lot mm -hmm. and action happens, then they talk about what happened. So there's a lot of conversation. As far as sound effects and getting music in there to build up the tension, I think it's wonderful to do things like that. And as soon as you start dropping in any sound effect into your story, you're, you've gone from audio book to audio drama production. Exactly. It, I mean, it, it really is that, to me, it, it really is that clear cut. For me, doing voices and changing, you know, the tempo and speaking faster for a tighter scene, that's still an audio book. As soon as you drop in sound effects, you've now 
started to go into audio drama and you've you've gone up one level as soon as you bring in other players and music you you just continue to add to the complexity and i'm so glad that john, someone like john is working on this because i know it's going to get the treatment that it needs. Well, you're saying exactly too, John. Do you feel that's the same case, that it's really a matter of the more you add to it, the more it becomes a radio drama? So audiobooks are radio drama that hasn't grown up yet? <laughs> oh, well, no. I, I, I wouldn't say that. They're very I wouldn't different. Say that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm waiting for you to time in on this too, Russell. But let's let's hear what John has to say first. Well, there's another type of format out there, which... Um, I'm kind of on the fence with it's the um, the full cast reading yeah. of an audio multicast recording. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. To me, when I'm listening to that, that seems almost like hmm, almost like a cop out. If you have everybody there, the only thing really the difference between that and an audio book is. Well, um, sound effects and music, of course, that's an oversimplification. Oh, no, I mean, if, because... if it were that simple, we'd be done. We'd be moving progressing very quickly on hounds of heaven right the big difference exactly. is that you have to rewrite the story a lot if you want to make it an audio drama exactly absolutely Yeah, because in, in a in a book it could be for example in hounds of heaven there's a scene where they're waiting for this elevator to open up to shoot these vampires well if it was a if it's a book or just an audio book that's read you actually have someone saying and everybody's pacing nervously looking at each other sweats going down you know you can build the tension that way mm. but when you're doing as an audiobook you don't want to you know you don't want to rely on the crutch of having too much voiceovers which i kind of think we had a lot of voiceover in here so what we did is we tried to bring up the tension with the music mm -hmm. um and also we invented some dialogue like the main character would say to one of the other guys hey i i you know you look nervous you okay Things like that to kind of give clues to the listener that, oh, you know, these guys are not sitting there all confident, but they're a little kind of nervous about what's going on. And that is very, very hard because you have to just create dialogue. Yeah, I, it, I, it strikes me, and, I, and I've probably said this before, that the difference that I see sort of – and again, it's never hard and fast rules. But the difference that I see between an audio book and audio drama is an audio book, you're telling a story. And in audio drama, you have the immediacy of being in the story. Yes. Uh, that's, that's my thought about that. How do you feel, Russell? Well, that's, it is a very different feel. And a lot of it depends on what you're using it for. There are people who actually do do extended driving, and it's really, really nice to be able to have something read to you. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how much you want to have really dramatic things happening while you're trying to uh, time your, your driving with the other cars. <laughs> That's right. You know, especially if you got honking in the story and you say, what was that? <laughs> or ambulances going by. That's happened to me while I've driven to work, you know, and I hear police <laughs> sirens on the radio drama. And I'm looking around going, what's going on? It can be difficult. That's true. And people have a tendency to be distracted by looking at the radio going, okay, what's going to happen next? So <laughs> yes. that they can actually see what's well, going to happen. Well, another thing to That's consider, fair. too, is an audio drama is more similar to television or a movie than anything else. Because when you're listening to a book on tape, it's more, it's more active. You, you have to pay attention to what's going on or you're going to miss something. You don't have music or action or sound effects to say, oh, I better pay attention. Like if you uh, have a TV on in the background, you're, you're on your computer playing and the TV show is going on, you can listen to all the, the uh, sound effects and you can kind of know what's going on. But if it's just a, a, a book that's being read, if you're not paying attention, you're going to miss things. You know, reading is very active. TV and audio drama is very passive, at least I feel. So um, an, an audio drama really takes active participation on the part of the audience. So, so you see, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. And how many times have I had to rewind the wheel of time because I missed something? And yes, it's like, wait, exactly. what just happened? Why are they suddenly killing people? Crap, i got to rewind it like five minutes to see what I missed. Yeah, I've, I've had that happen many, many times when it comes to a regular audio book. And like you said, an audio drama, you can start to fade out and you focus on work and all of a sudden, right. done! Oh, exactly. damn, I better pay attention. Exactly. 
Many's the time I've been in the movie theater and I wished I could press the rewind button. <laughs> yep. Whenever I watch The West Wing, I'm, I always want to pass. There's a lot of fast dialogue going past me a lot in uh, all of those works too. But yeah, no, I see what you mean because there's there's so much description that's being downloaded in in an audio book that if you're if you're not careful, you can end up missing certain details that you may linger on a little more if you are reading it visually. Exactly. Gotcha. Okay, well, that, that makes a lot of sense. So now we've got, you know, three writers that are looking at putting stuff together. What's the process then? So how do you go about taking what you're writing and uh, putting it in? Who does the production? Who does the direction? You guys want me to take that? <laughs> yeah, okay. I, fig- ahead, I, I figured you guys would make me do it. Take it, John. <laughs> and, yeah. and and actually, like there's, a um, there's another it. person take too, uh, a, a kind of a of a young fellow named Chris. He he does a lot of great voice acting, and he does writing too. And he has a couple plays that fits in the same type of genre we're looking for. You know, like your science fiction, mystery, horror, light horror, that that kind of stuff. And he and he's gonna adapt them too. So right. what I'm trying to do to eliminate some of the bottlenecking is instead of having it where we're all, everybody in the group is waiting on one person for each project. In this case, we we're waiting on the writer to do the first episode and then the second episode of Hounds of Heaven. We're gonna have a lot of writers, uh, Jr. Uh, Russell, at least for the the part of Coles. Um, I have another fellow named. Um, I have two Chris's that are actually writing. Um, we're going to have a lot of different projects going on. So we don't have that same bottleneck. Once we have a script out there, then it's just a matter of sending the lines out to the various people. And obviously our group is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, at that point, then the bottleneck that we would have is a big bottleneck. And that is the actual mixing of it. So I'm, I'm looking at getting another mixer. But also, and this is one thing that I haven't told you, Russell, or you, JR, about. This is the first time anybody's hearing this. I'm also looking to get an actual manager over all this. Someone that can be, for lack of better words, a slave driver or cracking the whip to yeah, say, okay, the whip. what are you working on? What are you working on? Because for me, it's, there's a lot that I'm doing. If, if I'm doing the mixing, if I'm doing the music creation and and I tell you, everything, I think with the exception of one or two of songs that was in my catalog that we did for Hound of Heaven, those are all original. That's that's not just something you just snap your fingers and you make. Those mm-hmm. are pretty hard, you know. Mm-hmm. So um, if I'm doing the mixing and yeah. I'm doing the working with the cast and working with the writers, it I got overwhelmed. So I, w- I want to put that mantle on someone that's else, right. someone that can crack the whip on me and say, hey, John, I need this music. Ideally, what I would like to do is just kind of be in charge of the overall production of it. Is What I mean by that is almost being like an executive producer, but also doing the sound effects and the music to have mm-hmm. separate mixers and have a manager who's going to overlook all this and assign the jobs. That's what we're looking to get in the long term, probably sometime this year. I see. What, well, you can just tell them that they can get their own business card that says <laughs> Cracker of the Whip. And that would just – I think that you get a number of people wanting that particular position just yes. for that. Hey, now, Glenn Higby is also involved with you guys as well. Is, what role does he play? Would he help out with that? Originally, he was he was a mixer. Right. And um, he's, he's good at mixing a lot of things like we're doing now. Mm-hmm like this kind of stuff he's good at doing mixing on um when you're talking about something which is half hour long you have a lot of a lot of dialogue you have a lot of music and stuff like that it's hard because he's not a sound guy you need someone that has that that perceptive ear of where the music needs to go in what kind of music needs to go in so what we're going to have glenn do is glenn is going to be pretty much in charge of the casting of getting the mm-hmm. people and auditioning the people. He's going to be in charge of that. When we had a, a company meeting about a week ago or so of something else I wanted Glenn to do, and I'm kind of rethinking that. What I was rich and Russell Tump will definitely chime in on this. What, we, what I was thinking of doing is having Glenn, as you know how everybody sends in their formats, you know, three or four takes of each one, et cetera. Uh, 
of actually having Glenn take those three or four takes and kind of pare them down and then send it over to the mixer. But I'm examining, I'm I really have to re-examine that because yes, that would make it technically a little easier for the mixer, but then yes, they have more freedom, but they have less, um, they, they have less freedom, but the responsibility is less too. So it'd be easier for them. But then what if they're not happy with the, whoever's doing the mixing, whether it's me or whether it's somebody else, if they're not happy with that particular take, well, then then what do you do? You see, right. so really kind of re-examining that. There is another thing that I think I've seen in which the first person who receives the lines can go through, clean them up a little bit. Right. Uh, sometimes a lot of VAs, including me, will send in half readings of a line. Right. And you, maybe maybe the uh, the first guy actually trims it down to three decent takes that right. the mixer can choose from. Right. And that would be that would be good. Also, things like noise reduction and all that. I hate to say grunt work, but that kind of is some grunt work. Sort of like rough editing it together too, and stuff like that. Yeah. I get you. Getting rid of the noise, trimming it down to where it needs to be, and then they're sending three clean takes or two or or four or whatever the the number is. So what what do you see like in in the grand scheme of things? If you want to, Hounds of Heaven, the group, get together and do stuff, what would you guys like to be known for? Do you want to be known as those folks who do a little bit of everything, or they're well-known for genre fiction on the dark side of sort of sci-fi fantasy horror, or is there a special kind of voice that you'd like to see Hounds of Heaven sort of show up in the audio verse. The the niche that I was going for from the beginning was at least ninety percent of what we do are book adaptations by authors who are who've already been published. Okay. With the other ten percent is gonna be maybe little one offs. Again, probably by the same authors. You know, I don't wanna get quite as big as something like uh Misfits Audio or uh, campfire radio because mm -hmm. I, I don't want to just go all crazy and have everything we're doing episodes of gun smoke and all that that's been done to death sure i i want to get a niche that has not done that much and yeah it's going to be kind of hard but you know to kind of misquote kennedy you know we're doing this not because it's easy but because it's hard you said it's a niche where there's not a lot of companies out there that are that are doing that exactly. aspect of it. So JR, how do you feel about I mean, you've you've already had Billy Barbarian, VNA Shipping, Murdochian Tales have all been made as free audiobooks. What's it like for you to, to, to go this next step of much more production and such? As I said, it's really exciting and it's fun to get other people's interpretations of your own work. I know we'll be doing a lot of work on the actual script, but it'll be fun to be actually play back and forth um, and see where the interpretation comes in. What really is the meat of the story? What can be cut out? What's going to be converted from, you know, as he said, they were standing by the elevator and they were really tense. Well, chop that out and where's the music going to come in and what music is going to come in? And that's where John has, I, I give him full liberty to do what he wants with the story to make it the best that it can be. And... I just am fascinated with the whole process. Um, I, I'm going to have well, a lot say, of fun. Well, let's say let's say that VNA shipping one and two are done, and it's like a roaring success, like it will be. And Woo. they say we want two or three more novels. Uh huh. Would you do that for? I've, uh... I've got ample novels. <laughs> no, but I mean of VNA shipping stuff that you haven't done yet. Of of the same series, I actually have other books in the same universe that we could go oh, with, okay. but and I am already working on VNA shipping three. Okay, um, yay. and I have yep, yay. I have two other series <laughs> that I'm currently working on that'll be coming out this year. One is done. It's the giant robot planetary competition, which takes place in the same VNA shipping universe, and I also have almost superheroes, which takes place at the same time. This isn't a spoiler, but when Joey left Earth in the original VNA shipping, this story takes place around the same time, uh, almost wow. superheroes. So it'll be well, yeah, a I, lot of fun to tie all those together. That's great. I was just I was just trying to gauge your willingness to take things sort of um, if somebody if they have a a, a request for 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 a new novel because you have such a, a large fan base, even coming through 
you know, radio drama. Because one of the things I guess that's always difficult as writers is the feedback, right? Is finding out, well, I'm glad you like this, but, you know, which which of my products would you like me to do more of if considering I, I have the time and the interest? Oh, absolutely. And that's one of the large challenges. And that's, it's also getting the exposure. The more exposure you have, the more feedback you're eventually going to get. And if people do enjoy, you say we do V&A shipping one and two, and people are like, okay, where's V&A shipping three? Well, hopefully by that time I'll already have V&A shipping four done, and V&A shipping <laughs> three will be ready to go. Um, mm. I don't see it taking you know, months to get this done. I see V&A shipping one and two taking a year or two to get done at least. Um, mm -hmm. And like I said, in that time, I'll be writing four, five, six books or more, and V&A Shipping 3 and 4 will definitely be in that series with where I'm going. Russell, I, I know um, that beyond the writing side, because you've done so many roles and stuff like that, are you going to find yourself, you, do you think, coming in one of the roles as, as being sort of a major contributor here, of listening to the different actors and giving sort of maybe director's tips on different projects that especially the one that you're involved in to sort of help new actors or at least help guide actors in, in the right direction that is certainly possible a few years ago um kathy runella and i actually did a a uh, a series slash competition to do pretty much exactly that that we've actually pushed up into the uh hoh right uh, group mm. but as far i don't think we've talked about how feedback will go to actors. That's something I, I don't see as much as I think it ought to be done in a lot of audio drama. I, I know one mm -hmm. thing that we did discuss recently, as John alluded to, we had a, uh, an all-hands meeting a couple about a week ago, a week and a half ago. One of the things we did allude to is it would be nice to get everyone that's going to be in a given scene, a given chapter, and do a table read. Right. And get instantaneous feedback of, nope, you know what, you need to do that one like you're really freaking scared, not like you're kind of sort of scared. Exactly. And that's the kind of, and, and also modifying the scripts to say, read this as if you're really tense. Read this, you know, this scene, you are terrified. You need to sound terrified, have that quiver in your voice and sound terrified. And that way there's a little more direction in the, not only in the script, but we can do a table read and go, you're not dialing in that accent too much. You, you know, you need to get that one a little better. Right. Uh, and Jack, you've actually done that. Yeah, I, I, we've done that through through Skype. I'm thinking you, you'll probably like to do that through Google Hangout or, or Skype as well, where you sit down. Uh, how many people can you have? I, I've never figured out how many people you could actually have sort of on Skype, the Skype, I end believe, is eight. Uh, Hangouts is 15. Yeah. It's... Wow. That's, That's another reason cool. why I like Hangouts. If you have up to 15, you're going to have to have some solid control over all of the crosstalk exactly like keep your uh microphone on mute unless you're in the seat right one thing i wanted to kind of reiterate and i this is kind of an answer to or elaboration i should say when you're asking before like the grand scheme of things I, I would like this group to have to pretty much form a symbiotic relationship between us doing the audio or the, let's just say quote-unquote audio people and authors mm -hmm. so that's that's kind of where we're going for because the thing is as this gets bigger and hopefully more successful we may start even getting some bigger name authors mm -hmm. that are that are starting to look at it and be like hmm they've done this already and they've done this and this and this and i like the way it sounds hey i think that would be good i, I say symbiotic because obviously it's good let's take for example jr having or well i'll give you a real world example cole drews his books, just when we announced that we were going to do Hounds of Heaven, his book sales went up. <laughs> so, yes. Really? Oh, yeah. Book sales went up. That's because fantastic. people would listen to a little parts, little teasers that we put out of it, and they liked it. And they're like, well, I want to go and, and read the book this is based on. Even if we don't do anything else of Hounds of Heaven at all, just one episode and that's it. That's enough to make people want to read the book because they like the first episode, so they want to see what happens next. You see, so it, it's good for us because then we're getting, okay, let's just, let's just talk fantasy land. Let's say someone like Stephen King or Dean Kuhn says, hey, I want you guys to do this. What, what do you think our listenership would be? Mm -hmm. You know, and really, since this is not really done for a monetary thing, what we get as form of quote-unquote payment is feedback and listeners. Right. So 
so that's that's kind of what I'm looking at grand scheme of things two years from now, three years from now, et cetera. That's a great idea. Now, John, I, I know you, you did the music for Hounds for Heaven, and I heard the first episode, and it was wonderful. And I know you did the music for The Dentist for Campfire Theater as right. well, uh, which is a show I was in, Oh, you actually. were? I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't do an awful lot of roles myself because I, I just I, – I prefer uh, writing. And um, but I do uh, on on occasion if somebody asks me to do a role I'll I'll do it, um, but generally I, I don't look for roles because I just don't have the time. Um, but my question is, how do you go about deciding on those themes mm. in music for a story? Do you work from a script or for, or for inspiration, or do you think of imagery or what what comes to you to create those those soundscapes? It's kind of. Um... I do it two different ways. For one thing, when I'm when I'm reading the book, I kind of have a general idea. I look at certain scenes, like they're going in a club. Okay, they're going to need some music. Or, for example, um, in Hounds of Heaven 1, there's a part where the uh, the pilot is a guy named Grinder, And the guy who we have casted is, of course, you know who this is, Jack, uh, Michael Simpkins. Mm-hmm. So he's playing Grinder, kind of like your old country pilot, you know, that kind of person. So I figured it would be kind of fun to have him listening to country music. This is the only song that is not mine. If you remember when he opens up and it's, they're doing like a country song, that's actually right. a, a friend of mine from work who has a band here local in uh, Tennessee. And he, oh, that's yeah, awesome. and he's like, uh, yeah, sure, I'd love you to do Why not? Of course. You know, it's kind of like spreading the love, paying it forward. Why not? You know, I, I would love to help anybody. If, you know, if anybody else has some music and they want to include it in there, just, you know, give us a ring and whatever. Um, but what I did is I'd come up with certain songs prior to even hearing any of the lines coming in or even seeing the script from just reading the book, certain things in the back of my mind. Then when I was listening to the audio drama and I had all the dialogue, I was like, okay, at this spot here, it needs to be tense or at this spot here, it needs to be kind of like majestic or just the big grand scheme of things, like a big battle going on. And so I would say 80% of it was done after I had the conversation laid out. Right. So your, your background in music, I'm, I'm interested. Did you start off uh, with piano or some form of, uh, or a guitar or an instrument? Piano. And, and then just sort of a piano. piano. Yeah. And then you built on from there writing your own music. Well, it actually, it's funny. My first, well, if you want to go back really, really old when I was a teenager, my first exposure to music was guitar. But, you know, I, I'm, I found that I have the same problems playing guitar as I have with playing piano. I got relatively fat fingers, so I, I can play piano okay. Mm -hmm. um, guitar, not anymore. I haven't picked up guitar in 25 years. But what I started doing about 20 years ago, if you kind of imagine that time period, that's when a lot of club music was out there, and people were doing, like, uh, mixtapes. You know, they were taking various songs and mixing them all together like like a dj does so right. that's kind of i started doing that i had a friend of mine that did that and i started doing it this was all with low technology all just cassette tapes that was about 20 20 years ago well about mm -hmm. 15 years ago that's when software came into came into play mm -hmm. various programs like fl studio where i could digitally mix these together and i started doing that and as time went by i started adding my own music into it and using less and less of the pre-canned stuff that's out there it got to the point where 90 percent of what people are listening to was was my own composition and only a little bit of sampling here and there then i got to the point where i started thinking wait a minute why am i even messing with other people's material at all mm -hmm. when i'm doing all this so i started just making my own dance music you know the the club techno you know the big oof 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 kind of stuff <laughs> exactly just like jr did exactly like that um and, and i was, and i got a pretty good following especially like in in denmark god they love me in denmark for some weird reason <laughs> but you know in here in america you know, i even had a cd out there no one really liked it it right. was just kind of like yeah whatever you know to paraphrase or actually to quote eminem uh no one listens to techno <laughs> so i started thinking with the skills that i have what can I do to get my music out there? Mm -hmm. Someone mentioned this, like, well, John, what you're doing with all your instrumental, except for, you know, if you lower the tempo down, you're pretty much doing soundtracks. 
So then I started approaching people that um, are doing independent movies, independent web shows about doing music for them. In the beginning, it was incredibly hard right. because um, everyone was using, and I hate to say his name, even though he's, he's, he's my, this next person I'm going to mention is my nemesis, but also <laughs> my inspiration. Um, I'm sure, Jack, you know this name. Russell, you should know this name. Kevin McLeod. Of course, for an Incompetech. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Everyone's like, no, no, I'm doing from Kevin. Kevin, Kevin, Kevin. So I started thinking, who is this Kevin McLeod guy? <laughs> you know, and I examined what he did. I saw his business model, and I said, well, you know what? Imitate it. And I started doing exactly what he was doing, giving away all my music for free, unless you wanted something specific for me to make for a commercial program, then I'll charge you. Mm -hmm. and, and little by little, it started getting more popular. And then I said, well, I want to do more stuff. So, And where is this website drama. that people can get this for those uh, people who desperately want music from John Carl Toth? <laughs> probably the best thing to do is just contact me on Facebook. I, I have a, a website out there, but I'm probably going to take it down because it doesn't get, I, I'm not active in it. Right. You know, um, Facebook is the easiest way to get a hold of me. So just search for me, John Carl Toth on Facebook. Contact me there. Mm -hmm. um, especially if it's an uh, independent film, anything like that. I'm, I'm relatively busy. Though right now, I only have two projects going on in addition to what we're doing here. Two other side projects. You know, projects unrelated to Hounds of Heaven Group and all that. Sure. Um, so I, I am willing to help. Um, if it's something that is going to be given away for free, I won't charge you. Right. You know, um, but if people want to look at any of my credentials, again, on IMDb, look me up there, John Carl Toth. I have a lot of stuff there. Um, only one, two, two, three, three, three commercial films. Right some pretty big Hollywood ones too. So that's, that's, that's kind of nice, you know, for sure. Um, so basically that's it. So Facebook easiest way to get a hold of me. Just John Carl Toth. He's Perfect. And, and on Facebook also is hounds of heaven, the series for those yes. people to look you guys up there. Is that the best site for people to go to? Yes. Yes. Because if they, if they have a question about anything, even though the, the first episode is there, they can just write a message. It goes admin, which is basically me and Glenn. And we'll get back to you less than 24 hours, most likely going to be within six hours or less. And you have space in, in Drama Pod as well. Yes, that's actually where we're hosting it at uh, with uh, Tim in down Tim in Australia. Heffernan. Yes, that's great right. guy. Super great guy. Great. Absolutely. So I, we're running out of time, but I want to find out between all of you, and you can all sort of answer this, and maybe we'll start off with Russell and then uh, JR and end off with John. But um, there's, there's between you, you have multiple mediums that you've worked on. Video that John's been doing, web comic uh, that Russell was doing as well, uh, novel that JR was doing, and an audio. Do you have a favorite medium? Uh, which one do you like most and which comes most naturally? Russell. You mean for to to use for adapting? For to to write for and to to be involved in to listen to enjoy. Well, the only things I've I've actually written for has been um, uh, just flat text. I've got a, a web novel out there, and um, and some and audio. I've never tried writing mm -hmm. for the other media. So, but I mean, is that your favorite? stuff that you're working with do you like writing the flat text better than the audio drama or? it depends on the story okay. some stories just seem to want to be done one way versus another do you have wishes someday that you do write in in the the visual medium as well uh i don't know it's uh my son's actually in that business and there's a lot of stuff that i that i just don't understand very well i tried my hand at writing a short film script actually adapting it from a radio play script that I was working on. And it is, there's just a, so much that's different. Mm -hmm. I'd have to spend a whole bunch of time learning the new medium, and, and I just don't have the time for it. Gotcha. What about you, JR? Is, is the novel where you, uh, you most love? Yes, I, I love writing short stories, and I wrote 100 in a year one time just to see if I could. <laughs> but I, I realize that I'm way too wordy, and short stories for me end up around eight to 10,000 words long for a short story and nobody buys those. So yeah, definitely for me, long form novels, um, anywhere between 50 to 120,000 words. I, I just really enjoy writing novels and just have a great time with it. I think I'm going to have a blast when it comes to 
converting these to scripts and seeing the scripts come to life because it, writing is one of those things where you sit down alone and you never know if anyone's going to like it. Writing a script and it's going to go from month to month writing scripts, there's going to be that feedback that's going to be like, yeah, people are digging it. Yeah, people are digging it. Let's keep going. So it's, I, I really think that doing the scripts is going to be a lot of fun as well. Excellent. And, and you, John? You know, I was kind of thinking about the answer to this question. Um, at the top of my head, the first thing I would have to say is probably film. Um, but then again, there's been countless times when I would listen to an audio drama. In fact, one time it surprised me because I forgot that I did the music for it. And then I hear my music and it, it just puts a chill down my spine. So it's it's really a tough call. It, it really is. Mm -hmm. I, I would say the type that I enjoy the most, if, if you want to just say, when do I listen to anything that has, if I listen to anything that has my work in, it's probably going to be audio drama because the fact that just there's more works that I have done that have my music in it. And I listened to something um, that Mike Murphy did uh, about a month ago, so I forgot what it is off the top of my head. And I was like, oh, this looks interesting. I'll listen to this. It's over at Misfits Audio. And then I heard my music, and, I'll, and a smile came on my face. So <laughs> I, it's, it's, it's a tough call. I mean, it, it really is. Um, I, I like doing the, the, the film because I probably like listening or viewing a film more than an audio drama. But it's, it's really hard to say. If I had to just pick one, I would have to say film. Well, I'm looking forward to more of Hounds of Heaven, the series, after talking to you gentlemen. This is a very exciting project. Thanks so much for coming to Sonic Speaks and talking with me about it. Thank you. Really good to talk to you, all three of you, uh, J.R. Murdoch, John Carl Toth, and Russell Gold. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks in, for James. having us. You're very welcome. Ready for launch. Beginning countdown in 10, 9, 8, Jack, 7. Jack, what are you doing? What is all this? David? 6. This is Nat's Room Control. Five. Nads Room Control. You mean where the National Audio Drama Script Writing five. Month uh, happens? Did, did I say five? Okay, everyone stop for a minute. I forget what number I was at. What were you saying? I was asking if this is where National Audio Drama Script Writing Month happens. Well, no, it all happens with you. Me? Well, not you alone, but everyone who has a great idea can begin their audio drama script writing challenge right now. Now? Well, it begins February 1st and goes through the entire month of February. Can I get back to the countdown now? Nearly. Where can people sign up again? SonicSociety.org. Look for the section on Nads Room. That's... N-A-D-S-W-R-I-M. Nadsrim. That's for the National Audio Drama Script Writing Month. Right. Okay, now? Now. Resume countdown. Five. Four. David? Yes? Would you like the honors? Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> Three, two, one. Here we go. This has been an Electric Vicuna production. <laughs>